Um, please note that today's talk will be uh, is being recorded. You, the audience, will not be visible in the recording, and we will be leaving um, and we will be leaving time for questions after the talk. And we are asking that you write your questions in the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you would like to vocalize the question yourself rather than have me read it out, please ask. Uh, please write "ask live" in parentheses at the end of your question that you submit in the Q and A button, and then I will call on you and unmute your mic so that you may do so. Now, without any further ado, um, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Don Dent. Uh, a Flint, Michigan native, Dr. Demp has been involved with community advocacy and organizing for over 25 years. Uh, she utilizes her own lived experiences to connect with students and parents to promote tools for self-advocacy, structural reforms, and strive to champion the concerns of those populations. Um, Dr. Demp holds an MA in Social Justice Studies from Marygrove College in Detroit, Michigan, and received her PhD from Arizona State University right here in educational policy and evaluation. Her dissertation was a critical ethnographic oral history study of a grassroots community advocacy group comprised of black natural and other mothers whom galvanized to challenge and dismantle the educational policies and practices that exclude black children from educational spaces. Um, she has published articles examining the possibilities of youth-inspired school leadership, uh, leadership as exhibited through youth voice and participatory, participatory action research, um, unpacking mm -hmm. and the difficulties mm -hmm. and potential of black and brown collaborative educational leadership, and how art can be used to expose the experiences of black youth who have experienced school exclusion. Um, she is currently an assistant professor at the University of Arizona's uh, College of Education in the Education Policy Studies and Practice um, Program. <laughs> Dr. Demps has been awarded the 2020-21 uh, American Association of University Women Dissertation Fellowship and Arizona State University's Dissertation Completion Fellowship. Uh, a, sample of, a sample of her other recognitions include receiving the 2019 University Council of Education Administration, the UCEA, uh, putting research into action award and being named the 2019 Hilliard Sizemore Research Fellow and UCEA Barbara Jackson Scholar. Um, as well as a Ford Foundation pre-doctoral uh, fellowship honor honorable mention. She additionally served as a member of the African Department of the Arizona Department of Education's African American Advisory Council and is the proud mother of three children, Journey, Jayanti, and Zora, ages 19, 17, and 9, respectively. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Don Demp. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I feel like you should get an award. You didn't need to read all of that. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I wanna start off by saying thank you. So yes, I am an alum of ASU. And so I am especially honored um, to have been invited back um, to speak. I would like to thank the School of Evolution and Social Change. And then um, obviously, um, Dr. Mesky um, Glexabar for thinking of me and even considering me. So um, as she already noted, my work is around this history of um, exclusion, specifically for black people and other folks of color out of educational spaces and the ways that those groups disrupt and resist those efforts, right? all along the educational pipeline, um, not just in K through 12, but all along, you know, in terms of students, as well as parents, how they are excluded, and how faculty members and administrators um, from marginalized populations are oftentimes excluded from these spaces, and what we can do to realize a different reality. So the name of my talk is Disturbing the Parad Paradox of Academic Impact, Ruminations of a Mother Bridge Interrupter Scholar. And I call them ruminations because these thoughts that I have had um, are something that I am working on for a paper looking at um, the institution of higher education, academia in general, and its role or its lack of a role in true societal uplift progress and change. we can go. Wow. 
While they were discussing the follies of their pets and their summer holiday trips across the country and overseas, I sat silent. Kelowna, South Korea, New York. My summer comprised of working research assignments, making barely enough to pay my phone bill. It was strategically unplugging all the appliances not in use in my home so as not to have to afford something that I couldn't afford to refill. It was denying my children seconds at dinner so as not to make them realize that there was a lapse in the food stamps. And so I needed the meals to stretch an additional two days if possible. It was going around to see where I could get a food box to tide us over until the next check. Using pay for food means another bill will be put off until right before disconnection, hopefully. It was investing all of the free entertain, it was investigating all of the free entertainment in the area because I couldn't afford to take all of us out to the movies or even to get an ice cream cone. It was and to acquire school clothes, backpacks, trumpets before the kids began school. What could I possibly sell now? It was shipping my babies off to a cousin's house because the lights, indeed, were off. It was me laying on my bed, staring at the black ceiling in the silence of that dark, powerless house, contemplating what had I done to my children. It was crying in that stillness, wondering what the purpose of this journey to the heights of education would afford me in the long run, and if it was worth the price of the ticket. Maybe I was making too much of it. Maybe I had schemed hard enough and they didn't notice, turning our lack into lessons. We is anyway, you don't need that. There are children who don't have any food. Isn't this park so much fun? You're getting so much exercise. Unplug what you aren't using because that's contributing to the destruction of the planet. Anything, but I can't afford my way until tomorrow. Mama just needs to see our way until tomorrow. I asked myself over and over again, why am I here and what have I done to my children? Years later, I was in the ASU library working on my competency exam, plugging away preparing for this test that would say whether or not I was eligible to go to the next level, if I was smart enough to be considered a PhD. It was then that I received a phone call from one of my former colleagues. Unfortunately, usually when Richard called, it was to give me bad news of something that had happened to the kids from my hometown in Flint who I had worked with for so long different. Dawn, are you sitting down? <laughs> yeah, we're sitting down. I'm in the library. Dead. Um, Chris is dead. Before, Richard had called me to tell me that another one of my boys had committed suicide. The story was the same, too much of the same, and it was too much for me to take. <laughs> what happened to Chris? He committed suicide as well in his brother's apartment while his brother was at work. I cried in the library, again asking myself, why am I here? What have I done to my children? This question kept coming up for me again and again, and it was not just a question of yes or no or having hard answers. It really went to the heart of who I believed myself to be. It was an ex existential question. And how does my involvement in, the ac in academia run counter to who I have built myself up to believe that I was? My investment in my community, my investment in all of my children. Was I just seeking to quell the internal dissonance that I was experiencing in which I told myself that there was a true answer to this. When I speak to individuals, um, I have been recognized in, as an activist or an organizer, and I do embrace the terminology organizer, but an activist 
maybe not as much though I have done action. Um, I consider myself first and foremost a mother, not only to my children biological that are born of my body, but to the children that I have wit worked with, that I have come up with in my community, in my home community, and to this global idea of children. I also consider myself a bridge. This understanding that if I am in a space that the people that I work with and work for are not, how can I serve to bridge that gap? As an interrupter, in what ways do I hear, do I observe, do I par and participate in things that are harmful to individuals and not say anything? Being an interrupter requires you to say something and to do something. And then a scholar. And I identify myself as a scholar last, um, not because of the um, things that we have read about and that the scholarship has documented in terms of um, imposter syndrome. Less and more of what, again, is the purpose? How does my scholarship or me being identified as a scholar further the goals of my home community? There was indeed a dissonance that I was battling with, understanding dissonance as a disjuncture between the stated goals and intent of a thing and what I was actually seeing and experiencing. I had sense of it all, and it took me a long time. When I got that phone call about Chris, I called my mentor, who also was my committee chair, crying. And I cried for two days because all I kept thinking was, had I have been home, had I been there doing the work that I had long been doing, actually on the ground, actually working with these young people, he would not have died. Maybe he would have been at the youth center with me. Maybe he would have been working with me in some other context. But believing that I could have interrupted, been a better interrupter on the ground than inside the walls of the academy working to p pass a test. Another reason that this, this jointedness um, pervasive, please next slide, um, was because there was an understanding that I had as a black woman coming up in the community about what my responsibility was to my community. A very specific goal of why it is we do this thing called education, especially beyond any rudimentary requirements of a K through 12, just get out, get a job, why would I keep going, right? And so I operate on this tradition of black scholars and other scholars from marginalized groups and populations who have used education as a launching point to further impact positively their people in their group. Anna Julia Cooper is one such scholar and Glass wrote in 2004 that Anna Julia Cooper was concerned about the welfare of not only black, but also all peoples. She strove to find common ground between African Americans and variously oppressed groups such as Asians and Native Americans. She attacked power to divide and antagonize these populations. Cooper laid the groundwork for coalitions so that diverse groups might unite, thereby increasing their social economic and political power. Anna Julia Cooper in the late 1800s, when she was just available to be considered a free woman, was an action-oriented scholar and had always been from the beginning. She states that it is not the intelligent woman versus the ignorant woman, nor the white woman versus the black, the brown and the red. It is not even the cause of woman versus man. To, nay, tis the woman's strongest vindication for speaking that the world needs to hear her voice. So in the late 1800s, and again, this is not the only um, black woman scholar at all who had this orientation, right? But she is the one who, for one, bridged the gap and was adamant about being a voice inclusive of black women when we talked about freedom struggles and the role of education in the late 1800s, that it just was not a black man's um, venture.
but that the black woman's voice needed to be heard, but that women's voice in general needed to be heard. Again, this storyline of voice, of not being fearful, of speaking out, not just keeping everything to the written page. Another one of my legacy builders is W.E.B. Du Bois, who I included after Anna Julia Cooper intentionally. You can ask me about this later if you want to. I will speak a little bit. Anna Julia Cooper um, would be what we would consider a black feminist today. Um, but Du Bois had a contentious relationship with her, even to the point of not giving her credit for some of her work. So they were contemporaries and existed and worked at the same time, but still, Du Bois' impact in academia was felt throughout. We can definitely talk about his problematics, but he always had in his mind that the reason he was doing this was to lift and progress the needs and the voice of his people. In his diary, he said, these are my plans, in his diary, when he first began school at Harvard. Make a name in science, to make a name in literature, and thus to raise my race, or perhaps to raise a visible empire in Africa, through England, France, or Germany, I wonder what will be the outcome. Who really knows? Again, we hear this stream, this strain of action, being action-oriented. Coming up into present day, um, again, we can speak more at length in the question section if you have any questions, is um, Dr. Derek Bell, who in fact was um, the architect of what we know today as critical race theory. Not going to go all the way into that because this is not a critical race theory talk. But what I want to focus on is Derek Bell's activism and his fearlessness for standing up for the things that he believed in Again, understanding he was alone in the academic space, in the university walls in which he resided. He didn't have a lot of support that was from his own group. He found his voice yelling into the wind um, up until the point where he had to leave the institution he was at because he was taking a stand for something he thoroughly believed in. Bell goes on to say, few, if any of us could survive in modern society by challenging every slight, every unfairness we experience or witness. I do believe, though, that most people are too ready to accept unwarranted and even outrageous treatment as part of the price of working or getting along, even of living. Next slide, please. Which brings me to Patricia Hill Collins, who I use um, in a lot of my work and how she thinks about the merging of activism and what we call mother work. She defines um, mother work as, she says, I use the term mother work to soften the dichotomy, dichotomies in feminist theorizing about motherhood that posits rigid tra distinctions between private and public, family and work, individual and the collective, identity as individual autonomy, an identity growing from the collective self-determination of one's group. So this tradition of mother work goes off into other mothering, what we understand as other mothering. And there is much in the literature about the role of other mothering in academic institutions, especially with black female scholars or black other mother scholars inside the academy and how it is they help to support and bring along their students taking on this other mother role, right? But in her definition, activism is an essential part of mother work and other mothering. Ultimately, community mothers commit to the maintenance and caring of the black community through their ethic of care, which inspires them to engage in activism for the benefit of their entire community. I highlighted family and work because I want you all to understand that when we go into these institutions, the logics that they operate under oftentimes run counter to the logics that our home communities operate under. It is hard to separate our work from our family, especially when we see children who need or students who need our assistance because they are considered this 
extended family, right? It's this understanding that they are not just students. If they are here with me and they are of my group, I do hold some responsibility to make sure they are as successful as can be. So really, it is an expanded understanding of what family is, the individual and the collective. So us as scholars, going back again to what am I doing here, right? Um, this legacy, this tradition of understanding that as a scholar, I am here, yes, to, to walk around the halls of academia, to exchange wonderful ideas about knowledge, but also to be in service to the group, especially when my home culture and my home group has needs that now I have access to, going back to the idea of being a bridge that they do not. So who did I believe I had failed? In some ways, at that point in my life, it was especially dark, I remember. Um, I felt I had failed my children. Now, they may not have known what was happening, but I did. And I was like, why was I taking away, in some ways, from what it is I could provide for them? And I'm not just talking about materially. I'm talking about time-wise. It a lot of time to become a scholar. And then when you become a scholar, it takes even more time, right? And we're all chasing tenure and all these other things. What did this mean for my family, my children who were growing up, right? Click again. The next one is what type of example was I to the children that I had served in my home community of Flint, Michigan for over 25 years? I left. And I dealt with that guilt when I left. Uh, is this the best decision that I should be making? Am I in service to this group? Next, the students who I helped to train to be organizers themselves, again, in Flint, uh, who had learned how to stand up and have a voice. But I thought, in my mind, they saw me leave, right? Click. And last but definitely not least, these are my boys. And I just want to spend a moment on them because they were such an integral part of how I came to my understanding of the work I do now, right, of the school to prison pipeline. And the hundreds of children that I had worked with, especially during my time at the Urban League and other youth centers, there was this core group of about 26 black young men who were there every single day. I could be there until 10 o'clock at night. They were there until 10 o'clock at night, right? And it was of this group that we lost two young men to suicide. A year ago, lost another one to murder on the streets of Flint for intervening, right? for being the example that we had hoped we had impressed upon him to be for standing up for a woman who's being abused by her significant other. How had I failed? How was this academic journey serving them? Next. During all that I have laid out up to this point, understanding the disjointedness, you can imagine my joy when reading Patricia Hill Collins, I came across this idea of intellectual activism that she forwards. She describes intellectual activism as a multifaceted phenomenon that links content and process, ideas and action, and oppression and resistance. And I felt so home with this definition because it was so connected to the way that I had decided to identify myself as a mother first, bridge, interrupter, then a scholar, right? So this understanding that is multifaceted, that is her exact terminology, that there are multiple ways to be activists in the way that we have come to talk about it. Again, we can talk about the co-optation of the word, um, in the word, in the ways that it has been sullied, unfortunately, like many things, right? Um, symbols that used to mean, used to be hope, the way that groups have taken terminology and turned it on its head, right? But she talks about the many things that can interact and connect, the different ways that we can be activists, right? It's not just marching in the street, right? It's other things as well. Paradox. Paradox comes from the root word paradoxon, para, 
meaning distinct from, and doxa meaning opinion. So it is distinct opinion that oftentimes don't mesh. So when we talk about academic impact, I think what we really need to be talking about impact for who, by who, and from who. The stereotype and rhetoric of colleges and universities as these hotbeds of untethered progressism, progressivism as promoted by some factions of society run contrary to the evidence of much of the university's history, especially if you are a black student who was not barely allowed into any university until 100, 150 years ago. And then when you were allowed in or when you are allowed in, dare you protest. Black students, even on college campuses, are disproportionately pushed out of school for their protest actions. Have these stereotypes of UCLA that were considered very radical in their activism. And in fact, UCLA Berkeley did, I mean, UC Berkeley did engage in a lot of activism. 1960s, 1966, John, Edgar Hoover, who was the first director of the FBI, said that the ag agitators on other campuses take their lead from activities which occur, occur at Berkeley. Ironically, three years later, the same Berkeley fired Angela Davis, not once, but twice, for her actions in the world, right? Not for her teaching practice, but her involvement, right? So when we think about institutions like the academy being progressive, or we think about how they've moved forward, changed because of protests, especially during the 60s that we saw, were those things that we saw because of the actions of students, or were they because of the institution? The institution in 1969 fired Angela Davis under pressure of the then governor, Ronald Reagan, who would soon be president. I think that most people who are in the academy who aspire to be scholars come in with the purest of intentions. They come in thinking that they will be able to not just change, but to have impact in the thing that they are actually worried about. Click, please. If you know who this is, but I will read. Before Mr. King was arrested, he had wrestled with the issue of police abuse of black people, joining the force in part to help protect people clo close to him from police aggression. He argued that diversity could force change in a police department long accused of racism. He had seen one sibling arrested and treated poorly, in his view, by sheriff deputies. He had found himself defending his decision to join the police force, saying he thought it was the best way to fix a broken system. He had clashed with friends over whether public demonstrations could actually make things better. He was invested on changing things from the inside. This was the officer who was, had his knee in the back of George Floyd as Chauvin held him down. Three days after he was on the job, he was part of probably one of the most altering things that all of us saw in terms of violence against black people. we caught on camera. This one example. But this young man thought he was going to change the system. This was his third day on the job after he had gone through months and months of training. The New York Times did an in-depth story on him to wonder how it is, to query how it is he got to where he was when he had such good, pure intent. One of the other police officers, not in his department, but in another department, who studied, internalized, 
change and police departments, said, how do you as an individual think that you're going to be able to change that system, especially when you're going in at a low level? You're not going to feel okay to say, stop, senior, whatever. The culture is such that the kind of intervening would be greatly discouraged. I mean to make you uncomfortable on some level to understand that acculturation is part of any institution and that academy and the university is no different. And while it is that we might not have professors or administrators, of course, choking anyone out on the street, there are other ways that the ways that we operate and push the fact faculty to operate can in many ways lead to death. Some of the results of the disjuncture that we have between the needs of the university and the needs of the community. Statistic of the week, I'm not going to read it, you see it there. Almost a million fewer students, black students, are enrolling in college. Some people would say, well, this is because of COVID. No, these stats were taken before COVID. So what we see is a lack of belief in what the university and academia is about and what it can mean for disenfranchised population. What is the actual impact? We know what the rhetoric is, that this is the route to the better life, right? But what a better life means is beyond just the material, right? Because we want to also help our communities. And if that's not happening, then why do we come here? Another impact that we can go on and on with the impacts is black folks are dying at three to five times the rate of everyone else from COVID. Now, we can talk about health disparities and how these things come together. But another piece that I think that people are not talking about, they're talking about the distrust in the medical system, they are. And I think that is absolutely a necessary conversation. But what we are missing is the distrust in academia as well. Because we put out research and scholars talk about the things that need to happen and the things that we need to do, but that community does not trust you because you are seen as an agent of an institution that has long mistreated their population. Another result is here in Arizona. If you're not in Arizona, let me tell you. <laughs> you should be fined, right? Um, and this is not just an attack on K through 12. Um, it is coming after, it has long come after faculty and the researchers in um, universities and what it is they're doing, how it is that they are silenced or attempts are made to them being silenced. And why is it that this is happening? So a lot of this is happening because again, this history and this divorce that we have made between communities and the institution. Next slide. George Garrison is another scholar. I'm going to read something. And I want you to guess why I'm reading it, about when he wrote it. It's always been with us and on a large scale, but did not impact the majority of the population to a significant degree, or for whatever reason, the academy in general, I mean, but for whatever reason, the academy in general has not adequately dealt with the truth about this phenomenon in our midst. No society can continue to exist as a highly developed civilization if it supports, allow it to exist unchecked. High levels of violence, hate, confusion, and misunderstanding. There is more rhetoric and polemic directed at the minds of people today than ever before. The rhetoric and polemic and the ugly politics from which they came have thrown our society into a mode of social decay and devolution with the very fabric of our national community, including the idealism that has been one of our greatest sources of inspiration, has begun to unravel. This has developed, Garrison goes on to say, to a large extent because of the inaction, occupation with other matters, and in some rare instances, complicity of members of the academy. It reads like he could have written this yesterday. But he wrote this in 1995. In a response 
to what had happened and what he saw the country going through after the Oklahoma City bombings. The familiarity of his comments is scary as an action-oriented person because it reminds me that the work is never done and we are literally still chewing over the same bites that we had taken 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, right? Another result of some of the inaction that we talk about um, when we're looking at the role of the academy and impact is what it means, please next slide, to individuals who want to come into the academy. I am a proponent of the university, even seeing its ugliness, and I will talk a little bit more about that. But when I go to speak to other people, it is a hard, hard sell to get individuals to come and join the ranks of PhD or to come and work at the university. It's one particular sister who I want to um, call out or to notice is um, Zakia, excuse me, Zakia Sankara Jabbar. She has been written about in a few books because of her activism. And she works on issues of the school to prison pipeline. As a matter of fact, Mark Warren just literally came out with a book called Willful Defiance. And she's on the first page of the book, right? So this is how phenomenal, phenomenal this sister is. And I had the pleasure of presenting with her at a conference and got to meet her in real life. And we were sitting down talking. And I was like, you really need to come into the university. There's so much work we could do. And there's so many things we can make happen. And she just listened to me talk. And she shook her head. She said, Dawn, let me tell you the truth. She said, I know that that university is going to try to silence me. And I am too, too committed to this work to engage in anything that I think will slow me down. And it really made me think, again, what am I doing here, right? What actual impact will I have? A month ago, I spoke with another young woman who has done global work, right, around immigrant rights. Saw her in the coffee shop in, in Phoenix when I was coming for a visit. And me and her had a conversation about, okay, well, when you get done with your master's, are you going go on and get your PhD, and she laughed at me too. Why would I do that when all it's going to do is slow down my work? I need to be somewhere where I can be free to do what it is I know I need to do with my people. So, <laughs> in my work, um, again, I worked with a group of grassroots black mothers um, in the state of Arizona who were fighting to change the school to prison pipeline. And there were some things that I saw happening on the ground and with their work. And all of the mothers that were part of this grassroots organizing group were at different spaces that I identified um, in three realms. The first one was assimilation. And we know about assimilation, but pretty much it's this idea that you, you deal with what you need to deal with to get through. Um, thinking that as long as you can get through, You'll have access to what you need to have access for so you can improve things later, right? Next one is transformation. So these were the mothers who were definitely committed to actively changing the system, whether from the outside or the inside, working to change the structure, right? To change the rules of the field, to change how things move to benefit their group, and let's understand not just their group, going back to the mother work idea, if you remember the definition, Colin said that mother work is this idea of not just being committed to your group, others, right? Not just your children, but other children. And so they fight for this transformation, usually through organizing and the other things that we usually associate with activism. Next. The last phase, and I don't call it a phase because these things could um, actually exist in the same time in the same space to different degrees and they can go around and around, is evacuation. It's when groups decide, you know what, we're done. There's no way to change the system. Um, we'll be here forever. We can either A, create our own spaces, or B, just leave it all alone, because really we don't need it. Others doing that, or a whole community deciding that's what group they're going to do, not just in K through 12, but in the higher educational system 
and in the academy, where does that leave the academy? What does that mean for us? up a little bit faster, but I'll go through, no worries. So in the academy, we place value on largely three things, right? Um, if there are students in the audience, you will learn soon enough if you decide to move on in your academic endeavors. Um, publishing, researching, and service. So in terms of publishing, we need to look at, or the university asks us to look at, right? Productivity, how much it is we're producing. You should always be writing. And not only should you always be writing, but where is it that your writing is ending up, right? Um, who are you considering to be um, a source of your claims for truth, right? Um, where is your epistemological understandings of how you find reality, right? Um, and you need to write those things down, and you need to publish them, right? So it asks questions when you are having an intellectual activist mindset of who has access to the research, who gets to determine truth claims, and who gets credit for those truth claims, right? So when we close off articles to individuals because they have to get from behind paywalls, right? That's not for the community. They can't get in there. And this is not even to mention how it is that the work is not publicized. This is also not even to mention that oftentimes you write in ways that are inaccessible to the average individual of any group, right? Who determine what it is the truth claims are? Okay, where do we consider knowledge? One little example is there are scholars still to this day that say that you cannot trust what students say about their, te their teachers because somehow all students are going to lie on the evaluations for their teachers, um, especially in K through 12 that they're not good at telling the truth, so we really can't trust that. When other research has shown that actually, when you observe inside of a classroom and you look at the things that students have said about what's happening in the classroom, guess what? It's true, right? And then who gets credit? When we write, who do we credit with the work that we write? Do we give credit to our co-collaborators? I'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into the research section. Um, do we put their names on things, right? Do we just say, oh, I need to be solo author on this. This is the only way it's going to count. So I'm sorry that all those 15 mothers that contributed to this work, and most of this is in their voice, but hey, I'm only going to put my name on it, right? The next area that the university is concerned about is research. Research, 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 because what are you going to write about? You need to do research to write. I met um, a, a outstanding scholar um, named T.J. Stewart, who talks about community accountable research. He said community engaged research used to be the ceiling, but really it's just the floor. It's just the beginning. So when you think about that, a lot of that is our power work, participatory action research, right? But there are still things about power inside of that, that we do not do a good job as researchers and as faculty dealing with. What does it mean if you are answerable to the community who are doing research not on but with, right? What is the pri primary placement of voice? Whose voice are you telling the story through? Is it through your own voice, right? Have you evaluated your own lens? Who, who, who's, who's speaking, right? Are you giving them the mic to speak or are you still holding it saying, I'm speaking for you, right? Do we recognize the co-collaborators in our research as experts of their own experience? And does the university, and do we as researchers have a material investment, a spiritual investment, and also are we answerable to these communities? And last but not least, the university wants service, right? Which is really labor. It's, it's the labor. It's the thing that makes the university run. But what we have found and what research has found is that there is disproportionality, especially when you look at the benefits to the university compared to the weight placed on especially women and faculty from minoritized groups and of color. There was a report that was put out 
called Equity-Minded Faculty Workloads. What can we do and what should we do now? And it says, one of the most important but often overlooked areas in which inequity can arise is within the distribution of faculty labor. Faculty from historically marginalized groups are disproportionately called upon to do diversity work and mentoring. Our women faculty do more teaching and service. While these activities are absolutely vital to the functioning of the university, they are often invisible and unrewarded. Invisible and unrewarded. So again, going back to what I was talking about just momentarily for Collins and mother work and other mothering and this lack of separation or this inability for us to always separate family and work, right? Because when we see our community there, that is part of our work. But I've heard people say, well, just say no. Just say no. Well, just say no is harder than you think it is. When you know that you are the only faculty of color, you are the only black woman, the only black man, the only um, Latino, Latinx person in your department, and they are having an equity committee that they're putting together, and it's only white people. Of course you have to say yes. It's hard to say no. And will they count that just as heavily as someone else who's doing a different type of service? So when we talk about that cultural understanding, that is understanding how it is not so easy to say no to opportunities just because, psh, just say no, forget about it. And then last but definitely not least is the recognition. Recognizing the work that these individuals do. I have joked and I am so serious that I'm going to add a mother work section to my CV so that people understand that in my department, I am the only black person here. And guess who flocked to me like within the month of me starting here, which I love it, right? But at the same time, I know what this means. And how will they count that? Or how will they not count that, right? So these are some of the ways that the university, while not blatantly saying, we don't want you working with your community, but your policies disincentivize me having a connection with my home community. Let's make the changes that we need to make. We need to look at what will be required. Patricia Hill Collins notes that intellectual activists who do de no, devote their attention to the public can pay a high price in the United States. Scholars and activists who place their education and service to their local publics are routinely passed over for cushy jobs. Chance to appear on NPR. In some areas of the globe, speaking the truth to the people lands you not on cable television, but under house arrest, in jail, or killed. So when we look at what would be required for us to really call the university to be answerable to the communities in which they have been built up, in which they reside. And then also to be answerable to their faculty and their staff and their students who come from the communities from which really they are taken from, right? Human capital is removed from communities and placed inside of the university. And many of us go in thinking that this will add to my toolbox of how I can serve my community. But then you get there and you're dissatisfied, right? It's like looking at a commercial on TV, seeing this nice juicy steak, and then you get there and it's a bologna sandwich, right? It doesn't look like the commercial had it looking. And so we need to understand that the ability for the universe, what we need it to be, exists. All of us, right? We have to push it to be brave, which is going to be the first thing because as Patricia Hill Collins said, this is not going to be easy work. And again, we can talk in the question area about how it is that we incentivize, right, disengagement and disincentivize engagement. We need to have a strong imaginary. We need to think outside of the box. We need not just to be constrained about what it is we're able to do and the way that things have always been done, right? To be empowering, we need to not only say that we're going to have you at the table, right? And oftentimes, that's often the, the response, right? It's this very superficial, um, put out a, a statement or whatever, but not really dealing with what's happening or the people are here at the table, but they don't really have a voice. 
not only giving people voice, but giving people power. We have to move just beyond voice to actual power and to that which they say counts just as much as the other people who in the hierarchy we assign um, higher authority to. And then the last one is commitment. And it's institutional-wide commitment to change the way that we have historically done business and to decide that we will commit. Garrison concluded in his um, thesis that he wrote after the Oklahoma City bombings, he said, sir or scholar, when fully actualized and properly focused, who is amply able to respond to these challenges that if left unchecked will determine, undermine our way of life. I still strongly believe in the possibilities of the university. I believe in the possibilities of the university because I have experienced these moments of greatness. And those are the things that have gotten me here. But what I have noticed is that those were niches, right? They were not the way that the university did business, but a particular office, right? Or a particular department, but not the way that was embraced by the university to do things. So in that way, I was lucky or not, depending on how it is you want to define it. I have come to settle some of the um, dissonance that I experienced um, by continuing to, in fact, work in my community, by continuing to use my knowledge and the organizing work that I have done, and by uplifting the voices of my co-collaborators in my research and doing it in that way. I do not personally believe that there has to be a separation that I try not to have a separation in my work. I close with Edward Said, who wrote one of my favorite books of all time called Representations of the Intellectual. And he said, nothing in my view is more reprehensible than those habits of mind and the intellectual that induce avoidance, that characteristic turning away from a difficult and principled position, which you know to be the right one, but which you decide not to take. I ask for us all to stand up and to take the challenge that will be hard and that will not be quick, right? To change the way that the university does business, to change the relationship that universities unfortunately have with communities of color and disenfranchised populations so that we really can live up to the ideas of being an equalizing force and a paragon of truth and imaginary. And I would like to just close by saying thank you. And I do hope and I look forward to engaging any of your questions. Thank you for that wonderful talk, um, Don. Um, I want to say that our Q&A is open for anyone that would like to send in some questions um, or comments. And um, maybe, I don't know if you want to take a moment, Dawn, to grab a drink of water or something. Um, yeah. There's just some folks uh, saying thank you so much for an enlightening talk and they have to run. Um, so I guess while we wait for other folks to come in, I just want to, um, I have a lot of things that I want to talk to you about because all the things that you talked about today are things that I think about a lot. Um, oh, I didn't realize these boxes were going to be in the frame. Um, <laughs> anyway, so you talked about the concept of other mothering. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what that means. I don't know that I, I mean, I think I have like contextual clues of what I, think that means, but I haven't really engaged with that term before. So it would be, I think I would like to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so other mothering is um, a term that is used in black feminist scholarship. Um, Dr. Stanley James from ASU expanded upon this definition of what other mothering is. And it's um, this idea that you help to care for the children, not just of your body, but in your wider community. So you take on this responsibility. So you do not replace the mother, but you are another mother, right? Um, so some of the research that has been done, especially in um, looking at ring and how it is utilized in academic spaces, talks a lot about like um, black student support groups inside the university 
especially when students leave from their state and they separate from their families from the first time and they attend PWIs and they're often alone. And so they look for those faculty members or the administrators who take on like this mothering type of a role, but there's also like this cultural understanding of what that looks like, right? Um, you know, kind of checking in like, you know, you shouldn't wear that, <laughs> you know. Um, maybe what some people might perceive as too much advice or whatever um, really feels that gap in those students' experience with, the, with them being in the university, being separated from family, right? And so these administrators take on that role and become another mother to those students. That's really interesting um, to hear you talking about that and, and about the other scholars who have talked about it in this very, I guess, culturally specific but positive light, right? Because oftentimes we hear uh, sort of a critique of um, the way that um, women faculty are expected to take on this sort of care work as an extension of sort of gendered uh, labor, right? And, and that it is... Uh, thinking about it in sort of like this negative light in the sense of it does have a real impact as you talked about sort of the, the disproportionate assignment of tasks and the expectation of service and the way that those things are not valued um, in the uh, sort of in the academy. And, and, you know, I haven't thought about it in the context of other mothering, but certainly this conversation around how people, um, the answer is always like, protect the faculty members' time, which of course, you know, you want that, but then there's the idea that like, oh, they shouldn't have to do this work, they should just focus on publishing. Whereas like the counter to that is, or you can value and recognize the things that they want to do the, to, to, with their community and, and, and um, sort of, what's the word, uh, reward that and recognize that versus saying sort of like the way we're going to fix this is to, uh, keep you from sort of like, because it's life-giving for a lot of us, right? Like the engagement with students, uh, the mentoring is life-giving, but if it's not recognized in sort of the thing that I'm going to be evaluated on at the end of the day, then it is disincentivized, as you said. Um, but also thinking of that, even that term mothering, oftentimes in the context of the academy, I feel like I hear it in a negative uh, sort of like, this is just an extension of sort of pigeonholing women into gendered labor, um, but in sort of this very specifically culturally um, specific sense, you know, how that's sort. I just, that wasn't a question, but that was just me responding, sort of. <laughs> and I think, um, and, you know, I didn't get to go into it, but definitely understanding that, so I, I think that it is um, it, necessary for us to do that mother work in the academy, that other mothering, but there goes the cultural disconnect, right? when the administrators say, well, just stop doing this and protect their time, and then what happens is that student, right, that you culturally align with goes to another professor or to another faculty member who is violent to them, right? And I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about psychically violent to them. And then what do you do? What do you do there in the department? Do you say no? And so they, they I don't think they understand um, that saying no is harder than you think. And exactly, instead of saying, well, you know, you need to do more of this, say, how about you value that just as much as you value that other thing, right? Um, who may not have, that may not have as much generational power, right? What I do with this student can have an impact on their family, on their community, on their children. And this article that I finished up, five people are gonna read, right? <laughs> and they're not gonna be mommy. So yeah. Well, I was going to say, I have a, that segue to another thing that you talked about that I really want to talk about, impact, but let's go to the Q&A, and um, let's see, here, <laughs> it says, Lord, thank you, okay, this is really just a comment, um, it's from, some, uh, from Ashley, it says, I'm uh, from Beecher and was a mentee in BSIP, um, so it's just amazing to hear you talk about home in this space. I'm forever talking about Flint and Beecher and how the ways we experience the world is so different from the academy and how there's so much the academy and the world could learn from us. There is so much power. Also, just feeling everything you were you were saying. While I still do, I struggle to encourage folks to come to college because of the violence of the academy, hyper surveillance, and the disconnect from home. I stay stuck and um, why I'm here and struggle to write. Yeah. Yes, and Ashley, I'm taking you out to eat. So, like, yes, she was in the program that I used to be. Yes, 
come to Phoenix, I'm taking you. But no, exactly. And so that, I went to, um, then, how old? It's been 15 years ago now, without aging myself. Um, I went to Ghana and Nigeria. And um, the first week there, I was not well. And it wasn't because of the food or it wasn't because of the water. I was not well here because what I saw were countries full of black people who had these two different realities, right? And, you know, you have people who literally have mansions, right? And then around the mansion are people who live in these places that are made with like these tin roofs and the stuff that we see on TV, right? They exist in the same space. They don't do what we do here in the United States where we separate them and we don't want you in our neighborhood and we have the police to keep you away, right? That's not happening. So it was very troubling for me. I was very disturbed by what I saw, right? But at the same time, like a people that were so driven, right? They were hustlers before we were using that terminology. They were making something. They were like gonna sell it. They were gonna work, right? And they didn't want you to give them anything. I remember one of my professors tried to give someone something, like give her some money. She said, no, this is what I'm selling. You either take this, I don't take your money, right? She was like, I don't, I don't, I'm not a beggar. That's not what I do. So this, um, this reality was really unsettling for me and it took me a minute to get into it. That is what I was going through almost my first two years in the academy. Like when I went to get my PhD program, Ashley, I feel you. I was like, what is this about? So you want me, and no one's ever accused me of not speaking my mind ever, which, you know, <laughs> blessing or a curse, whatever. But um, I, I, I was troubled by the people who I perceived to be outspoken, not be. And then like this fear, it's this culture of fear um, where the silence becomes, I think, crosses the line between culpability, right? And, and for some of these things that happen. And so just had to get that right in my head. And I'm still working through that, which is why these are ruminations, right? I'm still working through all of that. So yeah, so love it, Ashley. <laughs> um. Please, uh, folks, send in any questions that you might have or comments as well um, while we wait. There's space, so I'll ask some more of my own questions. Um, so I, you talk about impact throughout, right, what you were just talking about, and then, the, you know, it, what's in your abstract where you sort of talk about impact on communities, and then I keep thinking of that same term within the academy, right, like what's the impact of your research when you're writing up your annual evaluations or whatever, you have to talk about sort of like the impact of your scholarship. And that word is really interesting to me in the sense of uh, it having such different meaning, right? Like, you, because it's not even, you know, you talk about, oh, it was read by so many people, was cited by so many people, and therefore it has this impact. But really, um, what is it doing in the world, right? Like, beyond sort of us just talking to each other in the academy, what is, what is the impact, impact, right? Like, what is it doing on the ground? And I think it's such a... a such an interesting sort of, it's interesting to me that we're using the same terminology, but like it really means something something different. And um, I taught this paper for this class last summer where uh, um, it was uh, talking about um, ethics and field work or something. And this idea of, uh, it comes up in the paper, this idea that like, oh, I, I don't say anything in the moment, right? When I'm, or I see something really problematic happening because you know, in that moment, if I say something, it could be alienating to uh, sort of like the, the folks in the community that I'm working with, even though I recognize it as being highly problematic, but I could do more, and it might not really make a difference in their behavior, but if I write about it in this, in this academic context, that somehow it's going to have a larger reach. And my initial response was, where? Like, who is reading this academic paper that's going to have somehow this magical impact? And in the moment, like, fully recognizing that like, you know, you, you know, not to put a fine point on in the a reference of what you mentioned about your former, former mentee um, interrupting and having his life taken, right? So clearly not to suggest that people put their self in harm's way, right, necessarily to do something to, to interrupt, but this notion that publication in and of itself or discussion within an academic whatever is impact right, somehow that it's going to have a further, like a larger reach, 
it's just it's wild to me. And it seems convenient. What is it? That that quote, that Saeed quote that you just had up, right? Like to me that's a convenient sidestep. Um, and we say, oh, but look at all these people who are reading my article, but the direct impact of sort of like you witnessing something, I don't know. Um, but yeah, but I just wanted to hear more from you about this notion of impact and, and um, what really can we do, right, within the academy that has actual impact on communities. Right, right. So, uh, yeah, you, you said everything. Um, and that's why I was saying, like, we, we need to look at impact for who and on who from who right um so the academy and again this could be another talk we could talk about the neoliberalization of the academy right and so when they talk about publications um to them that equates to there was more research there were more dollars that are associated with their research um and what does that actually mean for the communities that we're doing research on right so being from flint we have been researched to idiom just ridiculous Right. And, yo, I plan on doing some stuff on Flint <laughs> myself, but I'm from Flint. So I am going to take, you know, <laughs> some privilege in that. But um, people come in and go out. We have University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, an hour south of us and Michigan State University, an hour north. And this is not to call those institutions out. It's just to give you an example of these are primary institutions that are like drivable to this place that has so much historic issues politically, culturally, resource-wise, anything you think of is an issue in Flint. People just started paying attention to the water, another talk for another time. But um, they're not having an impact. They come in, they do their research, and they fly out, right? And that's it, and they write their stuff. You'll probably never hear about it, you'll never read it. And so I know that the people in Flint have a very like negative taste in their mouth when people come in doing research and they get researchers all the time who come in and then we can talk about um about the ethics of research right of how it is we gather data um this idea that we still have in the university i think it is slowly starting to change but we still have that all we're going to do is call up some people recruit some people and that's it and that's all we need and we're going to get the truth from them no you're not i almost guarantee you you're not getting the truth for half of them they're not telling you the whole truth because you don't have a relationship with them right you just came in you this person from wherever the heck you from you're not from the community you don't look like the community that's a whole nother layer right a whole nother conversation and you ask these questions that are kind of probing, right? And you write down some stuff. I don't know what you're writing, what you writing? <laughs> what do you mean that I'm saying? And then you leave. And then that's the end of that. So we need, I think in the academy, we need to teach how to do research differently in general. Um, I did an ethnography my dissertation. I enjoy ethnographies. To me, I think it's one of the best ways again talk about the problematics of ethnography but the idea that you go and you are embedded in a community and invested time wise right and you may not get nothing you be there a year and not get nothing because that's not what it's about it's about building relationship with people especially when you're not there in those communities and to the university that was a waste of time so to them that's had very little impact you could have wrote this that, and the other thing just went in there and asked them questions or sent a survey or whatever and not had an impact it's all about impact to the university and how it equates to dollars. Meanwhile, the community, the only impact they have is that some person, usually white person, came in, asked me a whole bunch of nosy ass questions and flew back out right? and, and extracted from me, right? Extracted my information and used it to their own benefit. And so I think the university needs to do a better job of recognizing that and redefining what impact is, which kind of goes back to the conversation we were having about other mothering and mother work in the university, what it is you value. And if you only value this thing, this publication that very few people are reading and not value the other stuff that honestly keeps your institution running, let's be clear um, that the service we do and the things that we do outside of the academy has probably way more impact than the things that we're doing inside that you all consider to be impactful. Absolutely. Oh, it's another comment from Ashley. She says, right, and the research on Flint is not humanizing at all. The research doesn't see us as a cultural site of production with rich histories, resiliency, and long-standing experiences with structural violence. 
have anything to add. I think Ashley should be on the panel next time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let me see. Uh, Nicole, did you have a question? Um, you can write it in the Q&A at the bottom, or did you want me to un unmute you? Um, while I wait for that, for her response, I you talked earlier, um, I, can't, I, I didn't catch the citation, but the distinction or the shift away from community engaged to c community accountable um, research and scholarship. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about that distinction. Yeah, so um, so I, I will say this, and, I, and I, I brought his name up earlier. So this is a scholar who I just was able, um, you know, fortunate enough to be able to interact with um, Dr. T.J. Stewart um, down in Iowa. And he talks about this um, community accountable research um, being this step. And so I did write with Dr. Uh, Melanie Bertrand talking about um, in par, right? And we consider participatory action research, if you don't know about it, is really um, this attempt to have scholars work in communities to, I would say, empower them with the tools of research, right? So that they can do research as well. Um, but there still is a power dynamic because at the end of the day, whoever is leading the PAR project, depending on their um, sensibilities, right, will still oftentimes ultimately make the decisions in terms of what type of um, scholarship will I have you read in, will I send to you, what types of um, things will be allowed. Oftentimes, especially if you're doing research like in schools or whatever, the scholars are the ones who sit down with the, the, the school system and makes whatever agreements they make, and the community isn't there when those agreements are being made, right? That's between the, the scholar and, and the institution. So when um, Mr. Stewart, Dr. Stewart, I'm sorry, Dr. Stewart was talking about this community accountable, uh, he was talking about what does it look like when they're not participants, right? that they were invited to participate in a thing, but that they are co-collaborators because they are, in fact, the site of knowledge, right? They are the experts of their own experience, and they are considered and weighed just as heavily as the scholar. So he talks about um, his process of going through and writing the work that he did with his co-collaborators, adding them as authors. Um, when he made his book deal, how it is he sat down with the publisher and then went with his co-collaborators and he said, well, we, they were like, well, we don't want to have to pay for the book. We want it to be open to the community. So then he had to go back <laughs> and say, okay, this needs to be open access. And so I can make sure that people have access to it, but it definitely changes um, and shifts. And I think that for a long time, we've kind of been leading up to that. Um, you know, when we have member check-ins and, and, that, and that type of thing. But I feel like this takes it like one step further to put them on an even field where his co-collaborators had just as much power as he did. And they said something, he was like, this is what it is. This is what they, because literally this is their information, right? This is their goal they're giving to me and they have allowed me in. And so, you know, they're, they're kind of like the bosses of this. So that, that's what it is. Um, again, I'm just getting into to his stuff, but I think it's really powerful and I think it's a game changer. Okay, so we, we have a, a question um, from one of our graduate students, Nicole Hernandez, and she says, can you talk about positionality statements? It seems like social scientists are using them to excuse the power dynamics as if it fixes things. <laughs> What to add to that? <laughs> so I think, like with everything else, that things begin with the best of intentions. Can I tell you what else I feel that way about? Well, she said her name was Nicole. Mm -hmm. I feel that way about land acknowledgments. And I don't know if I identify as a Native uh, First American, right? Native American person, I do not. But every time I hear it, my heart hurts for them. I'm like, are you going to give them their shit back? <laughs> right? so, so we have um, long, especially in the academy, engaged in this performance, right, 
of equity, this performance of diversity, this performance of being open, right? Um, this performance of community accountability without going deep with any of it is very superficial. It's all very superficial and people get frustrated and then the university says, well, don't you recognize what we did? I mean, well, look, you don't see what we, we've done, right? And so absolutely it doesn't go far enough. People, I mean, sh I taught my qual class last semester and everybody had to do a positionality statement to get ready for their dissertation because that's one of the things you do. And I think that the hope is, is that they actually are reflective of their position and their privilege, but there's no way you can make people be reflective on their privilege. We can't force that, right? There, there are these exercises we can engage in, but I can't make sure that after you get that exercise and you don't go get McDonald's, right? I can only do what I can do. Um, and, and so, yeah, I agree that I think that you need to look at the actions. Being in academia, again, and this is no, I don't want to bite, like, like it here, but it is challenging, right? We have a lot of privileges as academics, right? I work here <laughs> in this cushy office. My kids are over there. They get to come in when they want to. They had a half a day of school. My son said peace. You know, um, I have all these privileges. You know, I have to write during the summer. Yeah, but my summer's off and all these things. But the depth that is necessary to create change is not going to happen at the university. It's going to happen when people from the outside pressure the university and the people on the inside work with them and they're both pushing against the wall together in some type of coordinated fashion. Um, that's the way I've always felt about organizing work, that you can't just totally have people removed from whatever system it is you're working to change, but you have to make sure that those people that are inside the system are strong right? Because the system is real good at flipping you, right? They're real good at that. Um, so those things, they are performative. For now, I'm sure there'll be some other type of performance, you know, like after George Floyd was killed. I missed that whole part of my presentation. There was a lot I missed. Um, but uh, there was a brother who wrote an op-ed for higher ed, and he pretty much said, what does it mean when, um, what's the name of the thing? He said, what does it mean when Ben and Jerry's ice cream can come up with a clearer message of solidarity with protesters and against injustice than the university can? He said, it means that higher education's interest in fighting racism is at best superficial and at worst cynical. Um, I've seen things happen at institutions that I've been at, with before I even became a quote unquote scholar where the administration, the leadership was like lost. Like, what do I say? I don't know what to write. And so they pick the black person in the room. Why don't you write it? Write it, and then I'll sign off on it. So you don't know what to say, and you don't know how to say it, and you can't address this thing. And again, this contributes to people of color and from disenfranchised populations say, this is not the space for me, right? And that is what is so sad and disturbing. And just to add to that, um, about the specifically about the positionality statement. To me, I think it serves a couple of purposes, right? Like one is the idealistic notion, right? Like that people will actually reflect and it will impact how they do the work, right? Once they recognize their position. Um, but of course we recognize that, as you say, a lot of these things are performative. So I think the actual sort of practical impact of a positionality statement is for the reader. So when I'm reading your piece, and I recognize, like you've told me now, sort of you've situated yourself in relation to the population or the people you're working with, and you're, you start making certain claims, I can read certain things with a grain of salt, right? Like, I'm like, mm, okay, but is that what you're saying or is that what the people, you know what I mean? Like, at, right. to me, it helps me understand as a reader what your position is in relation to the work that you're doing and have my own sort of use my own sort of lived experience to question some of the assumptions that you're making in your piece. So like to me, functionally, it does more of that than the former, which is sort of the more idealized, sort of idealistic goal of a positionality statement. Um, we have another question um, from Ashley, and she says, do you have advice on doing dissertation work 
and what is the role of collaboration collaborators in this process or in, in dissertation work of scholarship? Um, so can you start to say the first part of the question again? So what's your advice about doing dissertation work that involves collaborators? So like what would that look like in the form of sort of dissertation research versus like, you know, when you're a more senior scholar, I guess? Yeah, so um this is this is what I'll say, and I'm I'm very honest about this. I took an extra year on my dissertation because I was committed to doing it how I was committed on a survey. I could have flew in and just interviewed a few people at only one time and left. I could have only talked to the mothers that I was talking to and not talk to any community members or anything. But so I will say first thing, it's going to take longer. It will take longer. Um, if you're doing it right, it's going to take longer. Um, so a couple of the things that I did um, is I did member checks, of course. Um, but not only member checks, the mothers helped to choose the themes of my dissertation, right? So they read um, not everything, but they did read examples of swaths of things that I felt were fermenting and coming to the top. And then we had a meeting and most of them were the mothers who I had interviewed and been with for the last two, three years. And then some of them were new mothers, which was really interesting because this their first time looking at this stuff. They don't know who I was talking to in the group. They have no idea. and. I asked them what they thought about the themes and then they were like, okay, we'll reword this and you know, da, da, da. so I had them like to that extent. So that extended the process again, right? Um, then I did something um, that I will write about in the future, so don't steal this, called a cipher. Um, at the end of my study, which is pretty much um, a take on a focus group, but not a focus group because I wasn't the one asking the questions. I literally asked one question and then I left the group. And so Zoom, at this point, COVID was in, in full steam ahead. And in a way, I thought it was going to be impossible to do it. And actually, it helped because I was able to, like, literally black myself out in the Zoom meeting and just record and listen. And the mothers took it over. And it was a 100% organic conversation, right, without a scholar trying to redirect and say, OK, well, I want to ask this question. Well, that's not what they're talking about, right? And what it allowed me to do was check all the things that I had and see how much of that came back up or if any new stuff came back up that I didn't notice or recognize in their conversation. So those are some of the things that I did. Um, another thing is, um, ironically, today I had just finished a book chapter that I was working on and it's actually going to be the first thing to come out from my dissertation. And it's a story focused on one mother and the mother's going to be the co-author on the piece, right? Um, because literally this is your story. So 40% of the words in the chapter I wrote were your literal words. That's <laughs> it for this story, right? Why would I not put, so she's super excited. She's like, I'll be published. And I'm like, that's what it's about, right? And I think that's how, one of the things that you can do, that's how you start changing the paradigm. And again, honestly, I was inspired to do that by reading Dr. Stewart's work and how it is he was like wholly committed to making sure that his co-collaborators were part of the work that he was doing and not just extraction pieces, right? So yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so we literally have a minute left. We don't have any questions left in the Q and A. If there's something that you know you has been burning and you want to ask it, do it now. Um, but otherwise, I think we can wrap up. Um, I, I really love, we didn't get a chance to talk about it mu as much, but I really love um, that on sort of the, the hyphenated title that Bridge is there, right? I mean, obviously there's reference points um, sort of in literature and things like that, but I really like that. Um, it reminds me a little bit about, um, oh, no, I can't think of his, I can't think of his name now, up in Chicago, was on your committee. Stovall, Dr. Stovall. Yes. Yes, Dr. Stovall's work where he, you know, he talks about like his whole purpose in joining the academy was to bring resources back to the community. Like that was it. Um, and, you know, he's clearly been very successful in the academy, sort of despite being very vocal continuously about that. But I that I think that's another thing that sort of we should think about as sort of we move away of like that. Uh, another version of impact that's not just about what the scholarship literally is doing, but like that we have access to resources that communities that we come from might not. And in what ways can we be the bridge to bring those 
um, those resources back to our communities. Um, and and, and just to me? expand on that, like Dr. Silva was on my committee because he came to ASU and I got to meet him and read his book. Um, and that was another thing, you know, outside of reading more Patricia Hill Collins, but reading his book absolutely inspired me and gave me life because I was like drowning, right? And I was like, he can do this, like he's doing it, right? And so he's definitely an example of somebody um, who absolutely inspires me still. And so I asked him to be on my committee and he agreed. So yes, yes. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Depp, for that enlightening talk and that um, fun and engaged conversation with, um, and, and it was wonderful I, to see a, one of your former mentees. Um, uh, just a reminder to everyone, we have two more great talks coming up this semester. The next one is going to be on March 3rd. Again, Kisha Supernant from Canada. Um, and then our next, uh, our last one will be on April 28th, um, Dr. Jonathan Rosa from Stanford. And so I'm really, really excited for you all to join us on all of those as well. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. All right.